Welcome to the American Committee for U.S.-Russia Accord. I'm James Carden. I'm joined today by a very special guest, uh, the investigative journalist Aaron Maté. Uh, Aaron uh, writes uh, with the uh, Gray Zone, and he publishes um, very uh, long and uh, detailed dissections of Russiagate for real clear investigations. Uh, he has written for numerous publications, including The Nation, um, and his work on Russiagate uh, won him an Izzy Award uh, a number of years ago for his work um, on Russiagate. Um, and he is one of the, I think, one of the country's premier experts on this uh, rather uh, confusing um, topic. And I thought, you know, it would be good to have you on today because it seems uh, like the um, Durham investigation is now uh, picking up steam again. Um, in September, um, Durham indicted a, um, a Clinton associated lawyer by the name of Michael Sussman. He had worked for the law firm Perkins Coy. And then last week, uh, Durham um, uh, indicted and this fellow was arrested, a fellow by the name of uh, Igor Danchenko, who uh, had previously worked at the Brookings uh, Institution. Um, and so it seems like with the departure of Trump, Russiagate isn't really dead. It seems to be kind of this zombie story that uh, takes, has taken on a life of its own. And every few weeks, there are new characters and new names um, to, to keep track of. Um, so Aaron, um, I guess, if you might explain to you know, some of our viewers who might not be paying, you know, that close of attention uh, to it. What, who's John Durham and what's his investigation all about? And then maybe touch upon, um, you know, the more recent developments. Well, you know, it's funny, James, like you mentioned that even though Trump is gone, Russia Gate's still with us. But if you read the U.S. media, I mean, you compare the attention paid to it now with ongoing developments now and what it received during the Trump years, and it's night and day. Recall that this dominated US politics. This was the premier story of US politics for you know, more than two years. And it was sort of a, taken as an article of faith that this was a scandal that was gonna bring down Trump. And far from it, it actually, I think was a big gift to Trump. It's one of the reasons why I opposed it uh, for so long is because I thought that, you know, reducing Trump's opposition to a conspiracy theory that he conspired with Russia and that Russia was responsible for his election was a big gift to Trump because it was a big distraction from his actual agenda and the actual agenda of the dangerous administration around him, which included ratcheting up tensions with, uh, with Russia as you know, the liberal media and Trump's opponents were claiming that he was an agent of Putin. Trump was meanwhile escalating, I think dangerously, tensions with Russia, not necessarily because he wanted to, but that was the agenda of his neocon advisors. But, we, we, we can return to that. Uh, John Durham is a special counsel appointed under Trump by William Barr to look at the origins of the Trump-Russia investigation because uh, we've already seen so far that there was wrongdoing on the part of intelligence officials. There was an inspector general's report from the Department of Justice in December 2019 that found that basically the FBI had misled uh, the FISA court, when it got uh, wiretap applications on a guy named Carter Page, who was a you know, low-level Trump campaign volunteer. And Horowitz found that the FBI relied extensively on the Steele dossier, which is basically a collection of uh, fiction paid for by the Clinton campaign and written by Christopher Steele, a former British spy, alleging this like long-standing Trump-Russia conspiracy blackmail scheme. So Horowitz found that the FBI had uh, relied extensively on the Steele dossier and had lied to the court in uh, telling the court that Steele, some of Steele's information had been corroborated when in reality, the truth was the exact opposite. And um, one of the ways the FBI knew that the Steele dossier was bunk is because they interviewed actually the Steele dossier's key subsource, a guy named Igor Denchenko. And just recently, as you said, just last week, Denchenko was indicted for lying to the FBI about his role in the Steele dossier and specifically the, his conversations with the sources who, whom he allegedly used to come up with the material that went into the Steele dossier. 
And it's just one more humiliation for people who took Steele seriously. I mean, Christopher Steele was promoted as this like James Bond type super sleuth in the US media for a long time. Uh, when in reality, Steele and his main subsource were inventing lurid insane claims like the allegation about Trump with prostitutes in the Ritz Carlton. And they were uh, even, and they were relying on gossip that they picked up from people and adding their own, their own spin. And so one of the things that this new indictment of Danchenko shows is that while Danchenko claimed that he had this network of high level Russian sources, he basically had people who would tell him innocuous information like the, uh, the fact that Trump had stayed once at the Ritz Carlton in Moscow, and then use that to embellish the, the claims about, about the P-tape in the, in the Ritz Carlton Hotel. And then also that Denchenko had claimed that he even spoke to someone, a guy named uh, Sergei Milian, who's a Belarusian who lives in the US, was once the head of the Russian American Chamber of Commerce, when in reality, Milian and, and Denchenko never even spoke. So on top of the Steele dossier being just so embarrassing, both for the nature of its claims itself, you know, all the insane claims it made, and the fact the Clinton campaign paid for it, and the fact that the FBI relied on it for leads and for surveillance warrants. Now we have the revelation that the key source for, for it was even lying about the ways he came up with the lies. You know, it just, it, it never stops getting embarrassing. So if that's, um, you know, Danchenko's part in it, I'm still unclear as to what um, Sussman's role is it, it, it has been in it. So Sussman was, I think, the first person indicted by Barr, or no, that was Kevin Kleinsmith, perhaps. Um, Sussman was indicted in September. Sussman had worked for this Clinton Link law firm, Perkins Coy, and served as sort of a go-between between who? The FBI and CrowdStrike? Can you? Yeah. So Perkins Coy, uh, working for the Clinton campaign, they hired these two different contractors that were foundational to the Russia investigation. And in fact, basically fed the FBI information that the FBI used for the Russia investigation. So Perkins Coy hired Fusion GPS, and that's the firm that produced the Steele dossier. Mm -hmm. And then the FBI then used the Steele dossier for investigative leads and surveillance warrants. So they were not only you know, citing the Steele dossier and applications to the FISA court and pretending that it was credible, but they're also using it to chase down leads about like, you know, Trump and Alpha Bank and uh, Michael Cohen meeting with hackers in Prague and uh, Trump cavorting with prostitutes in the Ritz-Carlton. The FBI kept a spreadsheet and really tried to chase every lead that they could to corroborate it, which of course they couldn't because it was fiction. Okay. I have, yeah, I have two favorite pieces of fiction from the from the SEAL dossier, um, and it's not the P-tape. Um, the first is that Carter Page was offered 19.5% uh, stake in Rosneft. Um, Rosneft is worth about $200 billion. So yeah, it's a lot of money. <laughs> Carter was <laughs> offered apparently 40 billion, a $40 billion stake in Rosneft, which is uh, hilarious. And <laughs> Uh, the other, my other favorite part is that um, is, is that Steele was not only you know interviewed by the FBI, um, he was interviewed by professionals at the State Department, um, a Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary uh, by the name of Kathleen Cavillac, uh, and Cavillac uh, immediately saw through uh, Steele when Steele claimed that the Russians were making payments to Russian expatriates out of their consulate in Miami. And <laughs> Kavalax notes, so she notes kind of dryly that it's important to note that there is no Russian consulate in Miami. So, I mean, the Steele dossier is just littered with, with these sorts of, you know, fictitious, um, at, at times, you know, hilarious uh, uh, tidbits. And it, it, it was always puzzling to me how counterintelligence officials were able to use this stuff in front of the FISA court and then target uh, American citizens like, like Carter Page. It's amazing. And, you know, uh, it brings up a really uh, good point because, you know, 
the U.S. media spent two years portraying Steele as this hero, you know, a, a glowing profile written of him by Jane Mayer in The New Yorker. Jonathan Chait of New York Magazine declared himself to be a P-lever. Uh, Rachel Maddow did an entire hour-long special trying to promote the dossier as credible, on and on and on. I mean, it was, I mean, Steele was treated as this, as his hero, right? And well, and even as these revelations, like the one you mentioned about the, about the Miami consulate came out, but, and he was treated as this kind of genius because, you know, his, his admirers will, will say, look, I mean, so much of what he said turned out to be publicly reported. It, it, it later on was validated, but they missed the obvious pattern. There are so many instances in Steele's dossier when he, after something gets publicly reported, then Steele comes out with a claim that's like an, that's an appro- that is like approximately based on it. Yeah. So after, for example, there was this little controversy during the Republican National Convention over this meaningless platform change mm-hmm. where they watered down some language about you about giving arms to Ukraine. Only after then does Steele come out with this claim that like that ch- platform change was like a major part of the quid pro quo. Uh, between Trump and Russia. And there are many more examples like that. So this pattern was obvious, and I called that a long time ago. Uh, and now, and, and what I said was, was that basically what, what, what is, it's obvious what's going on here, that Steele and his sources, they're not spies, they're not sleuths, they're just good at reading newspapers and then coming up with a uh, fictional tale based on what's already been publicly reported, like Carter Page visiting Moscow. And then from that, they came up with this, uh, this, <laughs> this, uh, this tale that at that meeting, part of page was offered a stake of, of Rosneft. And lo and behold, in this Durham indictment, one of, uh, Steel, one of Danchenko and Steele's subsources, this guy named Charles Dolan, who it turns out is a longtime Clinton operative, he tells them that, you know, uh, that Danchenko asked him for a piece of information that he could use uh, basically against Trump to put into the dossier. Although it's not clear if Dolan actually knows it's going in the dossier or not, but regardless, Danchenko asked Dolan for a piece of information about Trump that, you know, uh, and basically Dolan says that basically I read something in the newspaper about, about Paul Manafort and then, uh, and, and then I just made something up based on that. So it's, so it's like Durham even confirmed what was obvious to me a long time ago that basically steel sources were basically reading the newspaper and inventing things based on that. So that's steel and fusion GPS and they're working for Perkins Coy. Who, uh, another contractor working for Perkins Coy, and this gets to Michael Sussman, another uh, Perkins Coy lawyer, is CrowdStrike. And that's the cybersecurity firm that generated the allegation that Russia had hacked the DNC. So it's worth pausing there for a second. You have then, for the two foundational allegations of Russiagate, one, Trump-Russia collusion, and two, Russia hacking the DNC, you have them being generated by Clinton campaign contractors, Fusion GPS for collusion and CrowdStrike for Russian hacking. And you have in both cases, their information, information that they gathered going to the FBI. And you have Clinton attorneys and Clinton operatives controlling the flow of that information. So, you know, you had Christopher Steele being a, he was a meeting with the FBI. He was giving them stuff. They were chasing it down. The FBI was citing it in, in their FISA warrants. And then CrowdStrike, and this is where Michael Sussman comes in. Uh, CrowdStrike gave the FBI their forensics of the DNC of the DNC servers, but it was Michael Sussman and CrowdStrike who were redacting that information and basically controlling what the FBI was allowed to see. And the FBI never independently examined the DNC servers. They relied on CrowdStrike. And that is unprecedented, especially for such a high stakes national security allegation. That, uh, um, investigation like that'd be like you know if i got robbed and i wanted the police to investigate the robbery but i insisted that i was going to do the investigation myself and the fbi would have to rely on my own conclusions i mean it's it's crazy but for some reason on both the collusion allegation the russian hacking allegation the FBI gave unprecedented powers to two clinton campaign contractors both working under clinton campaign attorneys it's it raised a lot of eyebrows and michael sussman was not indicted for anything to do with CrowdStrike, but he was indicted for something similar in that he was indicted for lying to the FBI when in September, 2016, he went to an FBI official named Jim Baker and gave him this like uh, a series of documents and some technical data purporting to show that there was a, a covert communications channel between a Trump organization affiliated marketing server and the Alpha Bank. And the implication of what Sussman was giving to uh, 
uh, the FBI was that basically there, this was a secret way for Trump and Russia to communicate. And now it turns out, you know, according to Durham's indictment, that um, it looks like this data was fabricated to basically fit a narrative that could tie Trump to Russia. So although Sussman's indictment is not related to CrowdStrike, it does raise more questions about whether CrowdStrike was a part of that same scheme that Sussman has now been indicted for. Now, was Sussman feeding that information, the Alpha Bank story, right? Uh, who was feeding that to journalists like Franklin Foer and Julia Yaffe and the rest of them and Natasha Bertrand? Well, one of the players was also Fusion GPS. Ah, so they Fusion, were, Fusion GPS was the link to the journalists. Uh, yes, and so we're, and, and I think Mark Elias, who's another Perkins Coie lawyer, the guy who hired Fusion GPS, he communicated uh, with journalists as well. But yeah, there's there's one email which showed, I think it's from, it's either from uh, Mark Elias or it's from Glenn Simpson of Fusion GPS where they email Franklin Foyer and they're trying to encourage him to publish his Alpha Bank story before the election. It's like they, one of them says time to hurry or something like that, like that they're giving him orders. And, uh, and Franklin Foyer did come out with his Alpha Bank story in Slate a couple of days before the election. And then, hilariously the Clinton campaign promoted this story including Jake Sullivan put out a press release saying that journalists and computer researchers have uncovered a possible secret covert channel between Trump and Russia hiding the fact that they were the ones who had planted this story um, so it's very very deceitful and that's what that, that's one of the things that came out of the assessment indictment do you think that uh, just going back to CrowdStrike because you mentioned them I, I recall that I think it was maybe the CEO or chief technology officer of CrowdStrike testified before Congress within the past year or so. And did he not say something along the lines of, um, um, we don't, we never really had any, we never really had any hard evidence uh, that the Russians were the ones who extracted the, the information from the, from the DNC? Or is my memory faulty on that? No, I mean, now, we got that testimony within the past year. We got it in May, 2020. But the funny thing is, is that testimony was delivered in December, 2017. So relatively early on in Russiagate, but we didn't get that testimony when it was made. It was buried for you know more than two years uh, while Russiagate was unfolding. And we, a year after Mueller closed up shop, he closed up shop in April, 2019, we got, the uh, Sean Henry testimony in May 2020. And this to me is the most, I, I, I think, one of the most explosive developments to come out of Russia Gate, where the CEO of the firm that generated the Russian hacking allegation, CrowdStrike, admitted to under oath that they actually had no evidence that these alleged Russian hackers, whom they accused of stealing the emails from the DNC, actually exfiltrated any data from the server. So if you have no evidence that Russian hackers stole anything from the server, how can you so confidently accuse them of stealing those emails from the server? It doesn't make sense. And unfortunately, during the height of Russiagate, during those many years of Russiagate, we, we were denied that testimony because basically Adam Schiff, when he took over as head of the House Intelligence Committee, he made sure that those transcripts, that those transcripts did not get out. And finally, uh, the, the Trump administration forced them out. So yeah, that was a, a hugely consequential admission. Uh, and because it's so explosive, the US media outlets that parroted Russiagate that just accepted every claim on faith have not reported it. So I've reported it at Real Clear Investigations and at the Gray Zone, but try to find another place, another prominent outlet that's reported it, and it just hasn't been because I think it's too damning to the narrative. No, I'm sure David Korn is hard at work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's funny. I recently interviewed Michael Isakoff, who was David Korn's co-author, and he dismissed that CrowdStrike admission as irrelevant. He said, oh, who cares about CrowdStrike? And basically, his argument was that you know, the U.S. intelligence officials had said that Russia did it. So what else is there to know? Oh, but, I mean, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Um, well, that's sort of the mindset that captures kind of the, the mindset of, uh, of the corporate journalists these days. Unfortunately, yeah. I um. You know, I can't help but wonder then, you know, you mentioned uh, Jake Sullivan um, just now. Um, there was a book, 
a few years ago that um, that dove into the Clinton campaign, the failed Clinton campaign of 2016. Um, I think it was by Amy Parnes. Um, and she had a co-author. John, yeah. Yeah, so these are, main, these are people who worked at, I think, the Times and Politico or something like that. These are very mainstream people, not at all, uh, not at all fringe characters or anything like that. And I, I, I believe that the book uh, reported that the day after uh, the election in November 16, that high-ranking Clinton officials got together in the headquarters in Brooklyn Heights. Um, and I think it was Podesta, Mook, Robbie Mook, Jake Sullivan, uh, and a few others. Um, and they were trying to figure out a way to, you know, shape the narrative uh, sh and kind of shift the blame for the loss away from themselves and away from their candidate uh, onto something else. Uh, do you know what that was? Yeah, I, I mean, exactly as you say, and not far from me right now, because I'm in Brooklyn, there was a meeting within 24 hours of Hillary losing and Hillary and her aides decided that they were gonna basically not take responsibility for their loss. They were gonna blame Russia and Comey. And certainly Russia became the thing. I mean, they pursued it re relentlessly. Uh, Jennifer Palmieri later wrote that the, the, the decision was to you know, pursue Russia above all else. And they did a great job at it. And it's funny, you know, I mentioned before that uh, at the nexus of, of the major Russiagate allegations, collusion, Trump-Russia collusion, and the Russia hacking the DNC, uh, are Democratic Party operatives, contractors like Fusion GPS and CrowdStrike. They are the ones who generated these allegations. And the other big foundational Russiagate thing, this, remember all the hype about Russian social media ads, brainwashing millions of Americans to vote for Trump or to stay home, not, not vote for Hillary and to, you know, so discord in the streets, these supposedly sophisticated Russian social media ads that, of course, if anybody looks at them, they're a complete joke and they're barely even about the election, way less than 10% were even about the election. And most of the ads that Russia paid for came after the election, which is a strange way to influence an election. But that whole thing was generated also by Democratic Party operatives. The Washington Post reported this, that basically when Facebook initially looked at these ads, they just saw them as another clickbait commercial venture where you basically, you know, put up some dumb posts aimed at certain audiences like evangelicals or gun owners or African-Americans in a bid to try to like gain a following and leverage that following to sell ads uh, and just, you know, spread your content around. That, that was Facebook's initial conclusion. But then uh, veterans of the Obama and Clinton campaigns then came up with their own theories that really this was a part of some sophisticated Russian operation. And then Senator Mark Warner got those theories of the Intelligence Committee, personally flew out to Facebook and shared those theories with Facebook. And lo and behold, not long after that, Facebook came out in the summer of 2017 at a time when Facebook was under increasing congressional scrutiny. And Facebook declared that, oh my God, we, we discovered all these scary Russian ads. And that begat that aspect of the Russiagate fear mongering campaign. So, Every single consequential core Russiagate development has a deep partisan tie. And uh, it's only because our media was so invested in that narrative that, that these facts are not um, widely known. You know, it's, um, and it's meant though, for those involved, humiliation after humiliation, because it's all based on you know, extreme exaggeration of the available evidence, or it's based on just outright fabrication. So I think, what you're suggesting to me is that the buff Bernie Twitter memes were not influential in the <laughs> election in Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan yeah. in 2016. The notion that these ads could have influenced a single voter, let alone swung the election, okay, which is literally what, you know, there, there's a whole New Yorker article about how Russian memes probably swung the vote. Um, the, the, like the notion that influenced a single voter, a single vote is just moronic. It's an insult to anyone to in intelligence, but yet there's a whole class of um, media professionals who really believe that these memes were, they've convinced themselves that these memes were significant. It's, it's, it's amazing, you know. Or they're drawing, or they're drawing checks from Fusion GPS to save right. 
Exactly. Yes, exactly. Like that yes. very good journalist, uh, former Times journalist, now writing for New York, I think, named Barry Meyer, who has uh, done a lot of work uh, showing the links between fusion, GP these fusion GPS, which basically puts journalists on their payroll. Um, and they produce very dishonest stuff, uh, as we've seen. Um, I guess I'll just end uh, by asking you whether you think that um, in the absence of a steel dossier, is there a Russiagate? I certainly think the steel dossier was hugely influential on the FBI, way more than they care to admit to. If you read the New York Times reporting now, the Washington Post, they go out of their way to say that steel dossier was not very important to the Russian investigation. When Mueller testified, he said, it wasn't in my purview. Um, I don't believe that. The official predicate for the Russia investigation makes no sense. The FBI claims that they opened it up on July 31st, 2016, not based on the Steele dossier, but based on them getting a tip about George Papadopoulos, who doesn't surface in the Steele dossier, by the way. And for good reason, it's because when Steele was writing his reports, George Papadopoulos's name hadn't surfaced yet in public. So since Steele had no inside information, he was only relying on news reports still couldn't have possibly known about him because he was basing all of his information on what he and his sources could invent based on what was already in the newspapers. So the FBI says that they opened up the investigation based on a tip that they got that George Papadopoulos received, quote, some kind of suggestion, unquote, uh, that Russia could anonymously help the Clinton campaign. This tip that the FBI got didn't even mention the stolen emails that are at the heart of Russiagate. It was very, very vague. So the FBI wants us to believe that based on that one tip, which doesn't even mention the stolen emails, uh, doesn't say how Russia could help, and is conveyed to a low-level Trump aide. It's like a, a meaningless person, relatively. A, a guy who's like not on the payroll even. They want us to believe that that is what warranted the opening of this like unprecedented investigation of a sitting presidential campaign during an election. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I would bet that Steele dossier um, helped trigger the, the Russia investigation. I mean, we know that well before the FBI officially opened the investigation that Steele had met with an FBI contact. So um, I certainly um, don't think the Russia investigation would have, and, and the overall controversy would have been um, what it was if not for the Steele dossier. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for helping to kind of untangle this very tangled uh, story and I, Really uh, appreciate you coming on, admire your work, and I urge everyone to uh, uh, to check Aaron out at his uh, show uh, Pushback uh, on, on the Gray Zone. And uh, where else are you writing for these days? Real Clear? Yeah, I, do, I, cover, I cover Russiagate for Real Clear Investigations, and all my writing goes on my Substack, which is just uh, mate.substack.com. All right. Well, Aaron, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, really appreciate it.